Hi, and welcome to Reading Greek Tragedies Online. I'm Joel Christensen from Brandeis University. I'm here with the Center for Hellenic Studies, the Cosmos Society, and a collection of great actors from around the world. Tim Dillap, Evelyn Miller, Tabitha, G Tabitha Gale, Tony Jaiwardena, Martin K. Lewis, and special guest Erica Weiberg. We've also got dramaturgical assistance from Emma Pauly and direction and help from Paul O. Mahoney. Today we bring you the play, The Persians by Aeschylus. Now this play was first put on in 472 BCE and it won first place with three other plays. What's interesting about The Persians is it's the only extant historical drama we have from ancient Greece. Now that doesn't mean there weren't others. Um, and it doesn't mean it wasn't popular at some time or, or another, but this is the only one we have. Um, and we know from ancient records that it was performed with plays of mythological content, with the Phineas play called Glaucus of Potnia and a satyr play um, called Prometheus of Firebearer. Now, this was not the first play in historical subjects in the ancient Greece. Um, and it seems that uh, the stakes for the performance of these plays were pretty high. According to Herodotus, uh, a contemporary to Aeschylus named Phrynichus was fined a thousand drachmas for setting a tragedy around the fall of Miletus and in, in, in inspiring emotions of pity and sorrow in his audience. The Persians is a different play. It's set in Persia. All of the characters are Persians. And this is a remarkable fact, given the fact that Athens was raised to the ground by the Persians in 480 BCE, so only eight years before. It would be the equivalent of a major US production telling the story of the war on terror from the perspective of the Taliban in only 20, 2009 or 2010. Now, Aeschylus himself fought against the Persians in 490 and seems to have lost his brother at the Battle of Marathon. The play is set in the Persian capital at, at Susa. The main characters are Queen Atossa, um, who is Xerxes' mother and the wife of Darius, who led the first invasion. And we get the ghost of Darius and a chorus of Persian elders and a messenger. And that's it. So compared to other plays that we've talked about over the past few weeks or seen, the action's fairly static. And its content is very different as well. It's focused on the experiences of an enemy he lost at war. In a way, it's similar to the Iliad in that Homer's Iliad shows deeply the emotions and experiences of the Trojans, but it's up to for debate how seriously ancient audiences might have taken this. Now, compared to the pyrotechnics of Euripides or the deep, not so deep sometimes, philosophy of Sophocles, it's hard to understand what to make of this play. So that's why I'm really glad today that we have Erica Weiberg here with us to talk a little bit about us. Um, so Erica, can you give me a little more historical context to this play? I think ancient audiences knew the actions, um, but also give me a sense of, of where this fit in the culture of the time. Yeah, thanks, Joel. Um, so yeah, I wanna talk a little bit about also this word historical that we're using to talk about it. Cause in some ways I think that um, that deserves unpacking. Um, this play is set after the so-called second invasion of Greece by Xerxes, led by Xerxes himself, and it tells the story of his return to Susa in defeat. Um, and that, as you, as you said, um, would have been an event that Athenians in the audience at the time, the, at least the invasion and the sacking of Athens, would, would have known about. And so that's why we call it historical, I think, in opposition to plays that are often termed mythical. But what happens in the course of this play is also imaginary. And I think that that is sometimes lost in this discussion, right? That no, um, the play, Aeschylus himself did not witness Xerxes' return to Susa. He's not recording it like a historian did. And instead, I think um, it's interesting to think about this play as an, as an example of Athenian myth-making. So as the, the actors perform their scenes, listen for the, the naming of the city of Athens. Because one way in which this play was used was to elevate the role of Athens in the Greco-Persian conflict to this realm of myth. And that was an important part of Athenian, in, the, the goal of the Athenian empire or the, the program of the Athenian empire, which was to set itself up as 
um, the protector of these other cities in Greece. Um, so. Thank you for bringing in that, that uh, or pointing out my sort of loose and fast uh, use of the word history there, right? Um, as we know, study myth and history from ancient Athens, it's really not until someone like Thucydides comes around and, uh, you know, criticizes Herodotus and others as muthologoi, storytellers, that we start to get a sense that myth and history aren't just part of the same continuum, right? Um, but in, you know, early Greece, uh, there's myth, um, and there's history, and they're all part of the same um, part of sort of tuning of the culture, of figuring out where people sit in relation to one another and telling the stories that make the people who they are. So I like, Erica, that you pointed out um, that this play is fantasy, right? I mean, it's not like history in Thucydides, where Thucydides, the historian, says, well, I'm giving you the accounts uh, that people are likely to have said, right? This, these are plausible speeches. Um, uh, Aeschylus had no way of knowing what Queen Atossa was saying or Xerxes, so it is pure fantasy. Um, and so, you know, as we think about the beginning of the play, I think it's important to keep that in mind um, because it starts out blending elements that we might find more common, common um, as devices in mythmaking. Um, so today we're going to give you most of the second half of the play. I'll give you a bit of a summary to get us there. Um, and then Eric and I will comment on some of the scenes in between. So the play starts with a chorus of Persian elders. And it's a council to the king and they identify themselves, the place and the time. So this might have been surprising for the audience. We really don't know because we have such limited evidence on how many uh, plays like this were performed and how common they were. Right. So the the chorus reflects on the delayed return of the Persian army and its king. And then they give a long catalog of the army's contingents. Um, so this is, you know, to, to follow up what Erica said, this is like the myth-making. This is like the catalog you might find at the beginning of the Iliad. And one of the reasons we really didn't want to put this on so this virtual stage today is that it's filled with names none of us know. Right? They're famous names, catalogs of foreign places, but they're just an accumulation of um, Persian heroes that we're not familiar with. So the course reflects on how the land and the people sigh with longing for the missing army, um, and it's deeply sympathetic in a way. Um, and then it expresses, expresses bluster in the face of anxiety. After a rather long introduction, the chorus welcomes the queen to their presence. Now the queen shares their worries and tells of a dream of two women representing Greece and the East with her son between them. And it gets pretty technical. I advise you to read it yourself. I'm not doing it justice. Um, and the chorus though tells her not to worry about the dream because dreams never mean anything in Greek tragedy. Uh, a messenger comes to announce that the army has been completely destroyed. And in between choral laments, he tells the story of the Battle of Salamis. So something we might wanna talk about afterwards is why this battle? Obviously, it's because where the Athenians reigned supreme, but it wasn't the final engagement in the Trojan, sorry, Trojan, in the war with the Persians, right? It's just one of many engagements over time. So the queen finds out from this message that Xerxes is still alive, but, and then the messenger presents another catalog, um, even lo as long almost as the first of Persian losses. So when we get to the scene we're about to start, with the leader of the chorus. We've heard about the great army that went to Greece and the lack of the army that's coming back. We know that Xerxes is alive and we're in a period of lament, but as an audience, we don't really know what's going to happen next. Oh, Zeus, king. Now you have destroyed the overconfident armed multitude of the Persian army, shrouding the cities of Susa and Agbatana in gloom and overwhelming sorrow. And many women share our grief, ripping their veils with gentle hands, soaking their bosoms drenched in tears. With agonizing female cries, the wives of Persia yearn to see the men they married only recently. They leave their wedding beds, the softly quilted joys of youth and howl with grief that has no end. And I, in great distress, take on myself the dreadful fate of those who now are gone. Now indeed all lands in Asia mourn their absent men. Xerxes, Xerxes marched them off to war, war. alas. 
Xerxes to our sorrow killed our men. Xerxes in his follow took them and set out with a sea-going fleet. Why then did the Darius, while he lived and ruled our city's archer armies, remain unhurt and so well loved by those who dwell in Susa? Our troops on foot and sailors left in the dark-eyed ships, alas, and went away on linen wings. Then other ships destroyed them, obliterating all with their assault at the hands of Ionian sailors, and as we hear, our king himself escaped, but only just through Thrace, on frozen paths across the plains, lament for those who perished earlier, abandoned by necessity. Alas, along Cyprian shores, such grief. Scream out your sorrow, clench your teeth, let cries of anguished mourning climb the heights of heaven, alas. Draw out your long and piteous moans. They are torn by the deadly surf, alas, and gnawed by those voiceless children of unpolluted seas, alas. The grieving household mourns its absent lord, and parents whose children are now dead cry out against the heaven-sent pain, while the old in sorrow hear of those men's agonies in full. Now other men in Asian lands no longer will abide by Persian laws, no longer pay the Persians tribute under compulsion from our king. No longer will they fall down prostrate on the ground and worship him, for, for the, the power, power of, of our, our king, king is, is gone. gone. No more will people check their tongues, for now they have the liberty to speak their minds without restraint. The yoke of force has been removed, and on that isle where Ajax ruled, the blood-soaked rocks washed by the sea, now hold the power of Persia. So Erica, if you could help us situate the content of this chorus just a little bit, because it starts out with what, with what seems like a really sympathetic lament, but then near the end, we get into this, these two stanzas, stanzas talking about rule in, a, in Asia and freedom and tongues and yokes. What's going on here? Yeah, so one of the um, overarching themes of this play is, is um, governance and leadership and power. And the play presents different models of that. So you have Xerxes representing this kind of overbearing, uh, aggressive tyranny. You have Darius representing a kind of more um, successful or ordered hegemonic authority. And then you have the Greeks as these representatives of democratic freedom, even though that's a bit ahistorical as well, since not all Greek cities were democratic, but um, this is a play that uh, has a very Athenian viewpoint. So I think, and one of the hard things I think for modern audiences to feel here is the historical context of overcoming an overwhelming enemy, right? We're still eight years mm -hmm. over and after an unlikely victory, but we're in a city that's in ruins. Um, Erica, remind me, I, you probably know better than I do, how much of Athens had actually been rebuilt by 472? Well, they actually made a, a a decision not to rebuild on the Acropolis, which had been completely um, raised to the ground, um, burnt down. They intentionally did not rebuild on the Acropolis as kind of a marker of the, the trauma that they experienced during the Persian sack, even though they had evacuated the city or most people had evacuated the city um, many of the, the buildings were burned down. So that was a really tangible, visible marker of what had happened in the landscape where the rest of the city had begun to rebuild. I don't think we know what percentage. Um, the Acropolis would have reminded people of what had happened. So would they have actually performed this play sort of on the side then of a burnt out, ruined husk of the Acropolis? Right. Yeah, so you, it would be visible behind the theater of Dionysus, which is on the southern slope of the Acropolis. So it really changes the context a bit. Now we're dealing with Aeschylus. So uh, he, like many early Greek playwrights, he's going to postpone the uh, entrance of the most uh, popular or famous character to the stage. So instead of Xerxes, um, we get first Queen Atossa, his, his mother and the wife of Darius um, coming out to join the chorus. My friends, 
whoever has experienced disaster understands that when a wave of trouble breaks over mortal men, they are inclined to be afraid of everything. And then when good fortune blows their way once more, they start believing that this same luck will keep blowing them success forever. In my case, all things now look full of dread. My eyes can see that the gods are enemies and in my ears echoes a sound that brings no note of joy. I am so overwhelmed by these disasters. They have made my mind so anxious and afraid. And that is why I come here from the palace once again without my chariots, without that pomp I used to have before, bringing offerings for the father of my son, libations to propitiate and appease the dead, sweet white milk from an unblemished cow and splendid honey distilled from flowers by the bees with water from a virgin spring and from their rustic mother earth, I bring this unmixed drink, this delightful produce of an ancient vine and this sweet smelling fruit from the plant whose leaves are always green, the olive, the golden olive with wreaths of flowers. But you, my friends, should chant a choral song to summon up the spirit of Darius while I pour these libations to the dead and make an offering for the earth to drink in honor of the gods who rule below. Oh, royal lady whom all Persians revere, pour out your offerings to the earth beneath, down to the chambers of the dead, while we in song will beg those gods who guide the dead down there to treat us kindly. O oh, you sacred gods of the world beneath, earth and Hermes, and you, O oh, ruling king of those who perish, send that man's spirit from down below up here into the light, that if he knows of any further help in our misfortunes of all mortal men, he is the only one who can advise us how to bring that remedy to bear. Our sacred godlike king, does he attend to me as my obscure barbarian voice sends out these riddling wretched cries? I will bewail my dreadful sorrow. Does he hear me down below? But you, O oh earth, and you others, you powers beneath the earth, release his splendid spirit from your homes, the divine one born in Susa, the Persian's God. Send him up here, that man whose like was never laid to rest in Persian ground. That man is loved, as is his tomb. We, we love, love the, the virtue buried, buried there. there. Oh, oh Idenaeus, Idenaeus. Who sends shades from the dead, send Darius up here to us. Send back our, our godlike god king. king. The ruler never lost our men to ruinous death in war and Persians hailed him as divine in his wise counsel for like a god. When he sent his army out to fight, he planned things brilliantly. Alas, Alas. O king, our old great king, approach us now, draw near. Rise to the summit of your tomb, lift up the saffron slipper on your foot Reveal the royal ornaments of your imperial crown and come to us, O oh, Father Darius, who never caused us pain. Come, come listen, listen to, to our, our latest grief, grief. The, the sorrow, sorrow felt throughout this land. land. O oh, oh, King, King of, of Persia's, Persia's King, King appear. appear. For over us the darkness spreads, a Stygian gloom, since our young men have just been utterly destroyed. So, so come, come to, to us. us. Oh, oh, Father Darius, who, who never caused, caused us pain. Aye, aye, to you whose death was mourned so bitterly amongst your friends. O oh, great and powerful king, if you had been in full command, who in this land would now be grieving such twin calamitous defeats? Our three tiered ships, now ships no more, have been completely overwhelmed. Our, our ships, ships are, are ships, ships no, no more. more. You loyal men in whom I placed my trust, you ancient Persians, once my youthful friends, what troubles are now threatening the state? The soil is beaten down and torn apart. It groans in great distress. I see my wife beside my tomb, and so I grow concerned. I have received the offering she made with favor, while you men have been standing here close to my grave, chanting your laments as with loud cries to summon up the dead. You have been calling piteously for me, but there is no easy path from down below. Beneath the earth, the gods are much more prone to welcome bodies than to send them back. Still, 
I do have some authority down there, and I have come. But you must not waste time, so I do not get blamed for my delay. What new disaster weighs the Persian down? That fear of you I had in earlier days makes me too awestruck now to look at you, and reverence inhibits what I say. But since I have responded to your cries and come up here from underneath the earth, you must ignore the aura that I inspire and speak. Tell me everything that has gone on, but keep the details brief, no lengthy story. I am afraid to act on your request, too full of fear to speak directly to you and say things hard to tell to those one loves. Since ancient reverence affects your minds, will you, noble and venerable queen, who shared my bed, hold back your tears and groans and speak quite frankly to me? We all know that mortal blows will fall on mortal men. Many from the sea, many from the land, afflict all human beings as their long lives keep stretching through the years oh you whose happy fate made you surpass all other men in your prosperity for as long as you gazed at the brilliant sun you lived a fortunate life men envied and persians looked on you as a god but now i envy you for you have died before you saw the depths of our misfortune oh darius you will hear everything a few words tell it all one might well say the Persian state is utterly destroyed. How is this so? Has our country suffered from some foul pestilence or civil strife? No, not at all, but somewhere close to Athens, all our forces have been overpowered. What son of mine led our armies there? Speak! Impetuous Xerxes. He drained the men from our whole mainland plain. That wretch, reckless wretch. Did he launch this foolish expedition by land or sea? By both. The double force proceeded on two fronts. How could the men, a group of infantry that size, succeed in moving past the Hellespont? Xerxes used a clever scheme to yoke the river and forge a way across. He managed this? He closed the mighty Bosporus. He did. Some spirit must have helped him with his plan. Alas, some mighty spirit came to him and stopped him thinking clearly. Yes, and we can see the result of that, the enormous ruin his actions caused. Why do you grieve for them? What happened? The destruction of our naval forces led to the slaughter of our men on land. And so the entire army came to grief, butchered by the spear? Yes, and that is why all of Susa mourns. The entire city laments its missing men. Alas for the loss, the help and defense of the army, gone. All those troops from Bactria are now dead. Not even an old man remains. Oh, wretched Xerxes, so many allies. He has killed off all our youth. The people say he is now by himself with a few attendants. How will this end? Do you have any hope he could be rescued? There is some good news. He reached the bridge that links two continents. He returned to Asia safely, is that true? It is. We have had news confirming it beyond all doubt. Alas. Those oracles have quickly been proved true. And Zeus has let their full prophetic weight fall on my son. I had hoped the gods would somehow hold off fulfilling them for several years, but then when the man himself is in a hurry, the God will take steps too. It seems to me a fountain of misfortunes have been found for all the ones I love. It was my son who, knowing nothing of these matters with his youthful rashness brought them on. He wished to check the sacred Hellespont by tying it down with chains just like a slave and that holy river to the Bosporus. He built a roadway never seen before, enclosing it with hammered manacles, creating there a generous causeway for his enormous force. Though a mortal man, he sought to force his will on all the gods, a foolish scheme, even on Poseidon. Why do that? Surely a, a sickness of the mind possessed my son. I fear that our great wealth amassed by my hard work may well become the spoils of anyone who marches here. 
Xerxes spent too much time with wicked men and learned to be impulsive. They told him how you had won great riches for your sons by fighting with your spear, while he, in fear, just used his spear at home and did not add to the wealth his father left. Jibes like this, which Xerxes often heard from these evil men, led him to organize this expedition and launch an armed campaign against the Greeks. And so he has achieved his mighty deed. The greatest of them all, truly immense, whose memory will never be erased. He has removed from Susa all its citizens. Something no man has ever done before. Not since the time our sovereign Zeus proclaimed one man should have the honor of being king in all sheep breeding Asia and should hold the scepter of imperial command. Medos was the first to lead its armies, and then another man, his son, who had a spirit guided by intelligence, finished the work of his father, the, the work his father had begun. Third, after him was Cyrus, a leader favored by the gods, for his rule brought peace to all his friends. He added to his realm the Lydian and Phrygian people and subdued all the Ionian forces. The gods felt no hostility towards him because his mind was wise. The son of Cyrus was the fourth in charge of Persia's armies, and Mardus was the fifth, a man who shamed his country and disgraced the ancient throne. But noble Artaphrenes, with the help of comrades who undertook this duty, hatched a scheme and did away with Mardus in his home. Sixth in line was Marathis and seventh Artaphrenes. When my turn came, I won the lot I wished for. Many times I led our mighty armies in campaigns, and yet I never brought such great disaster to our Persian state. But my son Xerxes, who is still young, has immature ideas, and does not bear in mind what I advised. For you whose old age matches mine now know well that none of us who have held ruling power was ever seen to cause such great distress. But then, Lord Darius, these words of yours, what do they imply? What do you conclude? After these events, what should we Persians do to serve this land the best way possible? You must not organize armed expeditions against Hellenic lands, not even if the Persian force is larger than before. They have an ally, the very land itself. What do you mean? In what way is the land their ally? Those armies which are very large, she kills with famine. Then we will raise some special soldiers and supply them well. But that army which is still in Greece will not get home safely. What are you saying? Will all our forces of barbarians not make their way across the Hellespont and out of Europe? Not very many. Only a few of that huge multitude if after those events we have been through, we still place any trust in prophecies the gods have made. For it is not the case that some will be fulfilled and others not. If the oracles are true, then Xerxes, convinced by empty hopes, will leave behind a special chosen portion of his army, now stationed where the river Asopus waters the plains and brings Boeotian land sweet nourishment. This is the place those men remain to undergo their punishment, the very worst disaster of them all, a payment for their pride and godless thoughts. But when they first arrived in Greece, those men did not display the slightest reverence, but broke in pieces images of gods and burned their temples. They ravaged altars, demolished holy shrines, knocking them down to their foundations, leaving scattered ruins. And thus, given their acts were so profane, the evils they must suffer are no less. And others are in store. They have not plumbed the depths of their disasters. More troubles will keep flowing yet. The mix of blood and gore poured out by Dorian spears across the earth of Plataea will be so great, the dead the corpse, their corpses heaped in piles will still be there when three generations have come and gone. 
a silent witness to the eyes of men that mortal human beings should not believe that they are greater than they are. For pride, when it grows ripe, produces as its fruit disastrous folly and harvest crop of countless tears. So when you look upon the punishment for how these men behaved, remember Greece and Athens. Do not let any man despise the God he follows and in his lust for something else, squander the great wealth he possesses. I tell you, Zeus does act to chastise arrogant men whose thoughts are far too proud. And when he does, his hand is heavy. So now that Xerxes has shown he lacks the prudence to think well, you must teach him with sensible advice to stop being so offensive to the gods through his presumptuous daring. As for you, dear lady, Xerxes' venerable mother returned back to your palace. Pick out there some clothing fit for him and then prepare to meet your son. His grief at his misfortune has torn to shreds the embroidered clothing covering his body. You soothing words and gently calm him down. For I know this, yours is the only voice he listens to. As for me, I'm returning to the earth, to darkness down below. Farewell, old men. Despite these troubling times, you should each day discover reasons to rejoice, for riches bring no profit whatsoever to the dead. To hear about the many troubles we barbarians must face, the ones already here and still more yet to come, fills me with grief. Oh God. I am overwhelmed with so much bitter sorrow, but one thing more than all the others gnaws at my heart, the disgraceful appearance of my son, the shameful clothing covering his limbs, but, but I will go and get appropriate robes and try to find my son. In this distress, I will not abandon those most dear to me. So that scene took us through I guess many different topical and emotional extremes. Um, one of the things that's perhaps difficult for modern audiences to understand is the sort of place that Persian nobility held in the mind of the ancient Greece. I mean, the king of Persia was so important uh, in the world at that time that when someone referred to the king, um, they meant him. And this was true for, for centuries. Um, so Erica, what do you think of the choice to make Atossa, the queen, um, such a central character in the play? And, and how do we read this last scene with the mention of his clothing? That's such a good question that I don't have a straightforward answer to. I think it's, it's complex, but it is significant that Aeschylus chose to make Atossa the mother of Xerxes the focus here and not, for example, his wife. He did have a wife at this time, uh, who we know about from Herodotus. And a lot of other homecoming plays are centered on the figure of the wife of the returning soldier. Um, so by making Atossa the queen, the central figure, she was the, the daughter of Cyrus, the wife of Darius, whom, whose ghost you saw in this, um, in this passage. Um, I think that Aeschylus is showing here how, I mean, maybe bringing up this theme again of how immature Xerxes is. Darius constantly is bringing up how, how rash he was, how he's too young to have done something like this. And so you see these two figures, Darius and Xerxes being contrasted there and Atossa being really central to that as well as this kind of figure that emphasizes the, their relationship, Darius and Xerxes, and also as um, a female figure who reminds you of her son's youth and mortality. Very different from the semi-divine Darius who literally rises from the dead in this scene. Um, yeah, the uh, ghost daddy being a central part of the scene is definitely strange. Um, and we'll talk about that maybe in a bit. Uh, but staying with Atossa and her connection to Cyrus, do you think there's some sort of sort of distanced hero worship going on by connection? Because I'm thinking back to Herodotus um, 
and where you know Cyrus conquers, like he's the character Herodotus has bringing Persia together, right? And Cambyses, the um, Asia Minor tyrant, is set up as a bad guy. Um, do you think this is sort of message going on that Cyrus was okay, Darius, uh, kind of a jerk who invaded us, but not so bad, but Xerxes, he's the worst? Yeah, maybe. I mean, there's certainly the suggestion that Xerxes has gone too far. Um, and you have a similar theme emerge in, in Herodotus, where one of the problems with, with um, these kinds of dynastic rules is that um, when power is the, in the hands of one person, if that person is a little off the rocker, then things can go really poorly. Um, so you see that with Cambyses, for example, in Herodotus. And here, I think, the danger is that you have this young Xerxes who, um, as maybe an act of revenge for what happened to his father, is, is um, taking risks that Darius himself never would have taken. Darius didn't invade Greece him in person himself. Um, Xerxes does, and, and you see Darius criticize his son's decision to do that and coming back from the grave to do so. It's not something I, I really thought about before. I mean, when we get Xerxes in our popular culture, he's the ridiculous character in that movie we probably shouldn't be talking about at all, <laughs> um, 300. Um, and there, you know, there, there definitely, there's a continuity in sort of making him to be extreme, right? The language um, Aeschylus gives his characters here about arrogance and overstepping is very similar to the language that he uses for Agamemnon upon his return um, in the play by that name. So in the next scene, we go back to the chorus um, as we move um, towards finally getting Xerxes on stage. Alas, how glorious and good the life we loved here in our well-run city. When our old sovereign ruled this land, our all-sufficient and unconquered king, who never brought us war or grief, our mighty godlike Darius. For first of all, we then displayed our famous armies and our traditions, like towers in strength ruled everything. Our men returning from a war faced no disasters. They reached their prosperous homes unharmed. Darius seized so many cities and never crossed the Halys stream or even left his home, places like the Thracian Achaloan towns beside the Stramonian seas. And cities on the mainland too far from the sea, well fortified with walls encircling them, obeyed him as their king. And so did places on both shores, along the spacious Hellespont, and in the deep bays of Propontis, where the Pontus flows into the sea. And islands close to coastal headlands surrounded by the sea, right next to us, like Lesbos, Samos, where olives grow, and Chios, Paros, Naxos, Mykonos, along with Andros too, adjacent to its neighbour Teos. He ruled the wave-washed isles as well, which lie far out at sea, Lemnos, the home of Icarus, and Rhodes with Cnidus too, and Cyprian cities, Paphos and Soli and Salamis, whose mother state has caused our present cries of anguish. And wealthy, crowded cities of those Greeks, descended from Ionian stock, he ruled with his shrewd mind. And under his command, he had enormous armies of warrior men. All nations were allied with him. But now we must endure defeats in wars inflicted by the gods. We cannot, we cannot doubt, doubt the, the truth, truth of this. For we, we have, have been, been destroyed, destroyed in war, war by, by massive disaster, disaster on, on the sea. sea. So right now we're finally a thousand lines almost in the play about to get to Xerxes. Before we get to Xerxes, though, I think it's important that the modern audience understand what this play is referring to, and that's the Battle of Salamis, which is a decisive naval battle, but by far, um, it's far from being the last engagement um, in the conflict. So, Erica, can you talk a little bit about why Athens is choosing, um, or why Aeschylus would choose to memori memorialize Salamis and not, I don't know, the Battle of Thermopylae um, or the Battle of Plataea? Yes, um, in some ways you gave the answer, I think, in your question just now in, in mentioning Athens, <laughs> but that's great. Um, yeah, in part, I think it's because this play uh, is intentionally forefronting Athens' role in this episode of uh, the Greco-Persian conflict. 
So the, yeah. So could you, could you just like quickly, if you don't mind, um, summarize the battle for, for people who might not oh. be able to deal with it? Well, this, Athens was known for their naval strength. And so what they could really contribute was, um, uh, was a fleet. And this battle um, took place um, between, uh, there's an island called Salamis that is um, off the coast of Attica and where, where Athens is. And um, this battle took place in the straits near that island. Um, and it was a, a huge naval victory for the Greeks unexpectedly because as you heard, they had only few ships 300 to the Persians thousands. Um, Xerxes was supposedly watching from the hill above the battle as everything went wrong. Um, this is all Herodotus as well. Um, and um, what I guess is significant here is that Athens really saw Salamis as their victory. Whereas other, other battles that happened like at Plataea um, maybe Athens couldn't claim as much as their own since it was really Athens who wanted to stay and fight that battle in the streets. Other Greeks threatened to leave. Um, and so Athens is, is saying here, look how important our role was in sending Xerxes back to Susa. Yeah, I, I, I really appreciate that context because it's also, a, it's a cleaner battle in ways than the decisive land battle at Plataea, right? Because right. if you read Herodotus's description of Plataea, you know, the, most of it, uh, run up to it, uh, Greeks arguing about who's going to be positioned where in the field and, you know, people moving their camps back and forth and they win. But Salamis is like uh, Thermopylae on sea, right? You have a small group of tough Greeks against a large Persian army, uh, navy, except what matters is that this battle is a victory that actually turns the tide of the war. Right? And as Herodotus tells it, it's a great drama where Themistocles basically bamboozles the Greeks into staying. He tricks the Persians into think the, thinking the Greeks are run, running away and single-handedly turns the tide of war, which should probably give us a little bit of suspicion. Uh, so now we get Xerxes reflecting on this. So as you listen to it, think about an ancient audience reflecting on its own participation in an era-defining battle. So, Xerxes. Oh, my situation now is desperate. My luck has led me to a cruel fate which I did not foresee. How savagely a demon trampled on the Persian race. What must I still endure in this distress? As I look on these ancient citizens, the strength in my limbs fails. Oh, how I wish a fatal doom from Zeus had buried me with all those men who perished. Alas, my king for our brave force and the mighty honor of Persia's influence, those splendid men whose, whom fate has now cut down. The earth laments her native youth, the soldiers Xerxes killed, who filled all Hades with the Persian dead. So many men, our country's flowers slain. Thousands perishing from enemy bows, a close packed multitude, all dead and gone. Alas, alas for all our brave protectors. O sovereign of the earth, all Asian lands are now upon their knees. A dreadful sight, so dreadful. You see me here, alas, a sad and useless wretch who has become an evil presence for my race and for my native land. For your return, I will send out in these harsh sounding tones a cry of ominous grief one full of tears, a shout of Mariandian sorrow. Then let your sad lament resound, a harsh plaintive cry, for the God has turned against me. Yes, I will sing my tearful chant to honor the men who suffered so in that defeat at sea, a dirge from those who mourn this land and lament its slaughtered sons. My doleful grief I voice once more. Ionian Ares with those ships of war turned the tide of victory and swept our troops away. The Greek fleet raised the murky sea and that fatal cliff on shore. Cry ye, cry out your sorrows and learn the tale in full. Where are they now, that multitude of friends so dear to us? 
where are the ones that stood by you who came from Agbatana? I left them there. They perished, tumbling out of their Tyrian ship by the coast of Salamis, beaten against its rugged shore. Aye, where is Farnucus, your friend, and Ariomardus, that glorious man? I am asking you about them too. Alas, alas, they caught a glimpse of ancient Athens, that hateful place. Now all of them at one fell blow. The pain of those poor wretches lie gasping on the shore. But there are other men we miss, like Xanthes, who has commander captained countless Mardian men, as well as warlike Ankaris and Diaxis too, and Arsakes, who led the cavalry. What you say truly makes me yearn for all my fine companions. When you bring up the evil times, that hateful woe I cannot bear. From deep within my grieving heart, howls out my pain and sorrow. They are gone, alas, and with no glory. I, the sorrow. Alas, alas, you spirits above, you bring us such disaster. So unforeseen and yet so clear to see as if the goddess of folly, eight, had glanced at us in this calamity. We have been hit by blows, smitten by unexpected blows of fate. Yes, all too clearly stricken. New troubles, strange disasters. It was bad luck for us. We ran into those ships and sailors from Ionia. The Persian race, as we can see, has had no luck in war. How can that be? Such a mighty force and I, a miserable wretch, have now been beaten down. And of our splendid Persian glory, what has not perished? Do you see my robes? What's left of them? Yes, I see. I see them now. In my quiver here. What are you saying? Is this what has been saved? This holder for my arrows. So small a remnant from so many. We have lost all our protectors. Ionian troops are not afraid to fight. They are a warlike race. I witnessed there what I did not expect. A great defeat. You mean the way they beat your warships, that massive fleet? When that disaster came, I ripped my clothing. Alas. 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 And there were even more catastrophes to make one cry, alas. Two, Two and three, three times, times more. more. Crushing grief, but for our enemy's great joy. Our strength has been lopped off. I am now naked, stripped of my attendants. By death of friends who perished on the sea. Weep for that catastrophe. Let your tears fall, then return back to your homes. Alas, such grief. Alas, for our distress. Your cries of sorrow, let them echo mine. An answering cry of anguished pain from one grief to another. Cry out and link together our laments. Aye, Aye misfortunes hard to bear. For I too share your grief. For my sake, beat your chests and groan. My sorrow drenches me with tears. Shout out your eyes to answer mine. We will, we will respond, respond to you, you my king. king. Now raise your voices high in your laments. Aye, once more we, we mix, mix our, our song, song of grief with, with, with these dark blows of pain. pain. Now beat your chests, and as you do, howl out a Mysian strain. Such grief. Such sorrow. And tear those white hairs on your chin. With fists I clench my beard and moan. Let your shrill cries ring out. I will cry out. And with your fingers rip your flowing robes. The pain, the sorrow. Now tug your hair out as you cry for our lost army. With these fists I clench my hair and moan. And let your eyes fill with tears. They do. They do. Shout out your cries to answer mine. Alas, alas. And now, as you lament, go home. Alas, alas, such grief to move across our Persian land. Such grief throughout the city. So much pain. So much distress. Tread softly as you wail your grief. Alas, alas. Such grief to move across our Persian land. Aye, 
Alas, for those destroyed in the flat bottom boats, the power of those three tiered galleys. I will be your escort and attend on you with, with mournful, mournful cries, cries of, of sorrow. sorrow. So thank you to the chorus and the other actors. We will come around to ask you about your experience of reading this play in a few minutes. Um, but I wanna start by thinking about the tone. Um, what I really appreciate of all the performances we just saw is the attempt um, to, to really inhabit the Persian space, to give them full voices and full characters. Uh, but one of the, uh, it's not really controversies, one of the interpretive issues with this play um, is how the ancient audiences would have seen this. Um, were these characters as real to them as say the Trojans were in the Iliad? Are they being portrayed as barbarians and you know comical or at least like um, condemnable in some way? Um, Erica, can, can you help us like, sort of figure out the, the tone of this presentation? Yes, this is a question that scholars have asked and, and people have taken opposite sides. I don't know that there's a consensus even about how we're supposed to view um, the Xerxes in particular. Is he a sympathetic figure? Um, like many tragic heroes, he has this arc of, of um, being great and then falling. Um, are we supposed to sympathize with him? And in this final scene of communal mourning where the chorus really joins him in this very powerful lament, um, and it would have been sung in a way that would have been very moving to, to hear in person, I think. Um, or are we meant to, because there is a degree of otherizing of making the Persians seem other from Greeks at the same time as there's a complicated kind of way of making them seem like the Greeks. So it's a, it's, there's no straightforward answer here. I don't think that tragedy is, is trying to give us a straightforward answer to questions like these. I tend to think that this ending portrays Xerxes in, a, in, in such a, um, if not sympathetic, at least in a way that makes you feel moved by what has happened to him. Um, but certainly, maybe some people in the audience would have thought, well, this, is, this just shows, this downfall of Xerxes shows how great we Athenians are. Yeah, so I, I'm with you in being confused and not being able to make a decision. So, uh, you know, near the end, this long lament, which we should probably talk about next, is sort of prefaced by this sort of bizarre obsession for a moment with his ripped clothes. And I don't know mm -hmm. if we're supposed to see like, you know, his, his lack of proper Persian dress as the Greeks mocking Persian decadence um, or an attempt to be in the Persian mind. Um, but then that sort of, sort of goes away. Uh, do you see any other signals in the play to sort of lead us to, uh, as you said, an otherizing of the Persians? One, one thing that people bring up a lot is the way in which um, this expression of extreme grief is often portrayed as feminizing. So these uh, male chorus members feminized by, as well as Xerxes in his ripped clothing, feminized by the expression of grief. Although that's something that you see for great Greek heroes like Heracles as well. Um, People have also talked about, right, the clothing is, is a really important detail and the costuming of the performance would have really drawn attention to the fact that Xerxes, this powerful king, appears on stage wearing only rags. Um, and that there's an association there between his rags and his, his fall from power, the, the shame associated with that. Um, and uh, Atassa in particular is very concerned about the reclothing of Xerxes. Um, I don't know that that in particular is, um, makes the Persians seem other, um, but some people have argued that it does. Yeah, so I, 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 to add to that before we can sort of kick it to the actors a bit, um, you know, women in the Odyssey, royal women especially, are shown to be concerned with clothing. Right, um, so uh, Queen Arete of the Phaeacians recognizes that Nausicaa has clothed Odysseus in their own clothing. And when Penelope and Odysseus talk, Odysseus uh, in disguise des describes his former self by uh, specifically mentioning clothing that Penelope made for him. 
Um, so there may be more, it might just be more general Greek misogyny or typical depictions of women in Greece than say just Persian. Um, so I think th there are lots of questions I'd like to ask you, Erica, but let's start with something from YouTube. They were asking about the presentation of um, the, the Persians as praying to Greek gods uh, on the Athenian stage. Um, do you have any problems with that or comments on, on why they did that? I think this shows you, um, you know, the audience of, of these plays were not just Athenians, they were they were meant to be others as well. Um, but I think it, in a polytheistic society like this, there's a tendency to imagine everyone just worshiping versions of the same large pantheon of gods. That said, you know, there, there are moments in this play I don't know if you noticed, but when um, the Persians themselves would refer to themselves as barbarians, um, yeah. which is not something that they would have ever actually done, but it shows you that this play is really a, a Greek um, reading of, like filtering the Persian court through a Greek filter, if that, if that makes sense. No, um, it, so It does, yeah. and there's this weird tension between sort of doing what they do in the Iliad, where they project like two peoples who basically have the same culture and then almost doing that weird thing, yeah, where they call them barbarians. And as you say, Herodotus goes to great efforts to identify the Greek gods with gods from other places, right? He lines up the Egyptians and the Greek gods. And early on in their histories, the Phoenicians and the Greeks looked at Melkart and Heracles as sort of one and the same type of figure. Um, so putting Zeus in there, it's strange, but it's not that strange. Um, now, the one thing you mentioned, Erica, that I'd like to ask the uh, actors about if they felt it is the, um, let's say, the feminizing grief or emasculating grief of Xerxes. And this play has a remarkable antiphonal engagement between Xerxes and the chorus uh, for the end of the play. So first to uh, um, Tim and Evie, how, how did being the chorus here feel differently from the chorus in the other plays that we've worked on? I mean, there's, there was so much more of it. I mean, that's an obvious thing to say. Um, so it felt, it felt the, the, the central experience was that of the civilization of those at home. It felt like um, maybe the filter of the play was, was more heavily weighted on hearing those stories and hearing of the defeats and how that affects the civilization at home. I wonder in the same way, perhaps that the Athenians would have heard the success stories of those same battles. I, I wonder if the chorus are kind of perhaps a you know a, a mirror of the Athenian audience. I don't know if that if that is in any way um, possible. Yeah, I think it is. Um, so and you know I wonder to sort of bounce back to Erica for a minute before I go to to Xerxes. Um, you know, is this use of the chorus the more extensive one? To what extent is it Aeschylean? and not just this play. So to give an example, I think one of the things we lose from doing it on uh, Zoom is that the chorus in the original performance had like 200 lines to populate the space. So for people who didn't read, uh, who haven't read it or seen it, um, Aeschylus starts with what we call a paradox, which is when the chorus, sometimes up to 100 people, enters into what we would now call the orchestra. And this is the open space in front of the stage where we now say we put musicians, but the orchestra means the dancing floor. So the chorus would have come in from the sides, filled up the filled up this space and performed this very long um, set of odes uh, before we even get to the action, which is very different from the other plays we've seen, but it happens in the Agamemnon as well. So Erica, what, what do you think? Are we talking about weird Persian play or is this sort of an Aeschylean habit? Yeah, it's hard to say weird when this is the first play we have, you know, what are you comparing it to really? But you're right, it has, I mean, Aeschylus um, has a very extensive use of the chorus and you see that especially in the Oresteia trilogy where you, you have a very long and, and intriguing paradox, that's that intrigue song that Joel just mentioned. And um, also the Eumenides where the, the chorus is actually a character itself within the play. Um, these, these monstrous female characters who are uh, representing Clytemnestra. Um, so yeah, I think Aeschylus is interested in, in the chorus. Also the suppliants, we can't forget the suppliants. They, they play a major role in their play. Um, 
Aeschylus is very interested in, in the chorus having a very important role. And I think in this play, they drive the emotions, um, just as um, you were saying about your experience of acting it. Um, I do think that, yeah, this, this chorus is, is the emotional heart um, responding to what the actors are, are, are saying and giving us a way of processing that. So um, just to follow up again, and we'll direct this to, to Martin who played Xerxes um, first. Um, so YouTube has asked, you know, would this type of Greek be emasculating in the Greek view? Like Achilles cries a lot in the Iliad um, and it may have just been, you know, natural or excessively weak, but maybe not emasculating. Martin, when you were reading this character compared to some of the others that you've worked on for us in another context, um, did you feel that he was, did you feel that kind of pressure? Or did you come at it from a different angle? Um, that's a, I guess that's a good question. Um, I didn't feel a pressure to to cry or anything. Um, I kind of just thought the the extent of the lamenting kind of uh, eventually, for me reading it, eventually brought me to tears. Kind of uh, him going over and over and over how much you need to let your cries be heard. Um, um, and it made me reflect on how much I think Xerxes thinks he's, uh, how much wrong he's done, how much he's failed. He's constantly going over and over and over it. And with the chorus, he's using them, what feels like a soundboard to just be like, what I've done is, is is terrible. I should feel a certain type of way about it. I never thought about it as emasculating them to cry um, or to to show emotion, but I guess that in the historical sense, it are emotions supposed to be feminizing or? I mean, I, I personally, I think there, there's a lot of room to discuss it, right? I think that, I think Eric has said it before about Heracles. I mean, heroes on the stage have extreme emotions. Right. Um, whether you're talking about crying or being angry um, or, you know, any of the other sort of base emotions humans feel. Um, mm -hmm. So maybe the excess is a problem. But, you know, I mean, we're talking about someone who had the largest army in the history of the world at the time mm -hmm. and who lost it to a bunch of nobodies clinging to rocks and hills. Right. I mean, it, it, it's ridiculous from his perspective. Um, I mean, from our teleological perspective, we're like, of course, and we come up with all these reasons why the Greeks won, right? Um, but it's still absurd, right? If you just think about sheer numbers and from his perspective. And, you know, if we want to be fair to Xerxes and Aeschylus, is there any way to ever process that level of grief, right? Like you lose mil a million men and you go home and you still have to like live and rule. Yeah. Yeah. Right? To go, to have to, to have to, uh go home to have to come back with your uh, tail between your legs and look back and know that you lost all of the lives that have all the lives that trusted you yeah. to lead them to victory to come back um that is a crushing defeat that's a crushing blow to one's ego i imagine uh, and i think you know uh, when we talk about the reception of plays we can move between well maybe for the ancient audience um, this one uh, was, you know, otherizing and celebrating the failure of the Persians. Um, but this play was one that we know was re-performed in Aeschylus's lifetime, which isn't common for ancient tragedies. So earlier, Erica said, when I said, is this weird? What I liked was that she hedged it immediately. She's like, I don't know. And the reason she doesn't know, and something I've been thinking about when talking with Paul about looking at some fragments, is that the city Dionysia, where these plays were performed, started putting on plays sometime we think in the sixth century. So let's just say 510 BC, which is a little, a little late for it, right? And they went on at basically 12 plays a year. Sorry, is that right? Yeah, 12 plays, including the Seder plays a year for over a century. That's 1200 plays at least that had time to develop the genre and standard and play with it. And we have under 40 and we have names for about a hundred. So when we're saying anything is normal or standard, like we are coming at it from such, um, uh, 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 such a position of ignorance um, that again, it's kind of absurd. Um, so just to put the scale there, uh, radically moving on. Tabitha, you were a Tassa. Um, I think Eric and I both think she's really just a fascinating presence in the play. Um, 
what ran through your mind as you were reading her character and so they're preparing to read today? Mm, um, I was actually thinking a lot. Somebody mentioned earlier about the the fascination with clothing did that attend when it came to Atasa's speaking or work had to become human because royal so synonymous with victory and with being you know undefe- uh, to see him be humanized was really and also part of why I believe Atasa was so worried because if you're human you can be killed. Yeah. Can I jump uh, in and, and and respond to that? Um, absolutely. I, I I think that's that's a very powerful reading of Atasa actually, and um, in some ways, you know, she's like Thetis, the mother of Achilles, too, um, who also has a role in providing armor or clothing <laughs> for her son, and um, yeah, this this concern because she knows that he he is mortal and he'll die. Um, I think that's that's really at the heart of um, that obsession with clothing on Atasa's part. I mean, from both of you, this is a way I've never thought of the figure before, right? I mean, Atasa is always someone who seemed to me she's like she's in a golden prison, right? Like a lot of women in the ancient world. Um, but then again, that you know, Erica, thank you for that because it makes me think of Thetis differently, right? Because she is in a way marginalized from action. Um, the way Atasa is. And I think Tabitha gave her a great reading. One of the things that's weird about this play though, is so Atasa makes sense to me. I can even get down with Xerxes weeping because it's hard to be Xerxes. Um, but what are we doing with the father, the ghost? Tony, when you looked at this play and you saw that you were coming back as the ghost of Darius, um, what did you think of that? How did you approach the character? Um, I thought, first of all, I thought it was extremely reassuring that even 2,500 years ago, fathers were still calling their sons stupid and rash and immature and uh, various things like that. And and also little mama's boys, because the only person he'll listen to is his mummy. The only difference being, of course, to now, um, I, don't, I don't think I ever heard my father say to my mother, go and put something appropriate on to talk to him. Um, but uh, other than that, that was reassuring. That was really nice. Uh, the uh, the bit I found gen- genuinely, I mean, we've had ghosts in, in Shakespeare and ghosts in plays all, all throughout um, history. I thought it was really interesting the way that he describes his journey. I thought it was really interesting the way he said, listen, it's really hard to get back up here, but I've got, I know a few people down there. I'm kind of a big deal, you know? So I got back up here, that was great. Um, I, and just the way that he put it, and then he was like, but I've got to be quick because, you know, I bought a little bit of time here. So no long stories. Okay, you can't deal with the fact that I'm a ghost. I'm not going to talk to my wife. Get out of the way. It was really, I found it funny. I genuinely found it amusing. Uh, <laughs> the way that it was so kind of like, I've, I've, it was almost like, you know, I hold a certain amount of influence in this company that I've managed to get a little bit of time off work, but I've not got a lot of time off work. I still need to get back there. I just found that hilarious that you had this kind of like time pressure under all of that. Um, And yet, even though he had that time pressure, would make very long speeches about how he was amazing and where he fell in the line of kings and how, uh, you know, his son was just an idiot. because those are the kind of things that fathers tell, say in stories to this day and say in real life. I love that. I love that reading. And I wonder how much it might adhere to sort of Athenian experiences of Darius versus experience of Aeschylus. Because I think as Erica pointed out, Darius didn't come to Greece. He sent his generals and he was the Persian king right? He never would have been unclothed in the way that Xerxes is. And the Greeks had this sort of personal connection to Xerxes, the failure, right? Because Darius died before he could come back and have part two, right? And he always got to remain that distant king. So um, I want to ask people in general, though, about the play and maybe move back to Erica for a bit and about how a historical play functions as imperial or pre-imperial propaganda. Right. I mean, now people are we're talking again about how Victor it's victors who write history. Um, but I think it's more complicated than that. And also about who would would appeal to 
So I always think back to when I was a kid, um, my dad, whose dad was in World War II, um, would always watch movies like Bridge Over the River Kwai. Like I can't tell you how many times he would stop on USA and he'd just watch that. Right. And even like, you know, some Vietnam movies he would watch, even though he never went to war. Um, but I think at later generations, we've gravitated more towards, you know, Lord of the Rings, Harry Potter, um, what, Marvel movies. Um, so, I mean, what, how, Erica, what is there some similarity there? And so the relationship between sort of the narrative myths we make and the way we consume them? Yeah. So, um, Edward Said called this text that were a text of Orientalism um, as a way of getting at how it has been used historically as a piece of propaganda. I mean, it was used in the Greek War of Independence, for example, to make modern Greeks seem like Europeans. But in some ways, I think that those binaries, the East-West binary, um, are ones that have been uh, added on top of this text rather than ones that maybe the seeds are there. Um, but I think the Greek relationship to the Persians was so much more complicated than that. Um, certainly there's um, a move toward race making in, in later in the fifth century in Athens. Um, but I think that this text shows you how there are different views of Persia even among a Athenian. There's the Darius, who's very competent, very good leader, actually. Um, and then there's the Xerxes, who, who gets out of control. Um, and yes, Greece is, is, this text is used to say Athens is, is the protector of freedom for the Greeks. So other Greeks, you should really follow us. Um, they used it as an imperial tool um, in, in, in Greece itself. Um, but Persia was a much more impressive imperial power than Greece ever was. Um, and, and this small victory by the Greeks didn't change that, even though the text itself makes you think that maybe it did. Um, so. And that's, that's one of the things I always uh, have to impress upon students when I teach Greek history, yeah. is the Persians didn't go away. They just like pulled a little bit out of the coast of Asia Minor and spent the next hundred years giving different sides of the Greeks money, right? And supporting different types of, you know, anti-imperialist and pro-imperialist um, uh, agendas. Um, so as we sort of move towards close today, I would love to hear more from the actors about what this play said to you in comparison to the mythical plays, right? I know I'm gonna take Erica's warning and say, well, this isn't history, um, but maybe we'll start with Tony, um, Tony's experience and then, and then move around. Tony. Can I, uh, just picking up on the last point that you made as well, what Erica said as, um, before as well about this being seen through a Greek lens, I think that's, I think there's an interesting um, tone to some of Darius' speeches where he talks about the burning of temples and talks about the, you know, kind of absolute uh, disdain with which the Persian um, forces showed in Athens and in Greece. Um, and I think what you were saying about this being just eight or nine years after the, an actual war, you know, I, I think that's actually quite restrained on 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 uh, Esclos's part because if we talk about it by any modern standards, any reaction to a massive war like that in the immediate aftermath, I think I found to be much more angry and vitriolic and and also. Um, making out the enemy to be evil incarnate, as opposed to some people that might, you know, judge it um, with an even hand and see, you know, uh, the, the good or bad that was in it. Another thing you say about imperial um, qualities, I was, it just reminded me of something we talked about when I was doing The Tempest. And The Tempest, which was Shakespeare written in, you know, um, 17th century or, or late 16th century, for the last 150 years in England, they said that it has been done with a much more imperial tone um, because of imperial England. So Prospero is seen very much as the invading force. And then when he leaves, it's how does that leave the indigenous people on the magical island? But it's been played in that very bent. So imperialism can definitely have a, uh, an influence on the way that we shape uh, some of our theatre, I think. Right. And, and, and we have to remember, I think, following Erica's earlier comment, that different audiences were there 
and that the audience had many different people with different experiences of the layers of history. So we tend to force an imperial frame on it that may not have made sense at the time, um, especially in 472. Um, so Tabitha, the, the last time you were with us in this sort of heavy mythical play, um, did you approach this one different knowing that it had some historical correlates um, or did you approach it in sort of the same way? Um, when I first read it, I found a lot of correlation to, I always do, I always look for how this fits into like our modern day and like what I can pick from and what's going on in our own society. And I found it interesting that there were a couple different ways that this could be read. Um, I really liked Martin's comment earlier about how Xerxes felt like the lament should have been heard and it had to ring out and it was with the chorus. It was communal lamenting over, you know, the potential failure, the repercussions, the state of their land. It wasn't, you know, a king necessarily and a chorus. It was a people. And looking at how Atossa reacted to um, just how the, the community, the community, because it is a community, um, the chorus and everybody were lamenting, you know, the loss of their dead. There were several ways you could take it as a leader, you know, being, uh, what's the word, being intimidated by the, the pain and the anger of their people or a leader or co-leader um, having empathy towards, you know, their, their country's loss. And so I approached it or I tried to approach it with, you know, the response that I would want to see out of our society today, which is, you know, an empathy towards what's happening in in your land in your, your world i think that that that's good it gives us good instruction of why you were all so sympathetic as persians um because you were trying to make it real i mean there's this line that we didn't read early in the play um where atas is speaking and she's saying look it would be super awesome and wondrous if my son did well and came back victorious but he lost and he's still going to be king anyway right and to me given our leadership in the UK and US, um, that struck a little hard um, because it does seem that no matter how badly some people in charge do, um, they still stay in charge. Uh, sorry to go there with it, uh, but Tabitha, like you, I'm, I'm always reading myself into poems. Um, Martin, um, Mr. Xerxes, uh, this, so this, did you, know much of the history beforehand? Did you read up on it or did you just dive into the character? Definitely just dove into the uh, uh, character. Um, but I, I had uh, uh, around maybe three years ago, uh, this story was brought up in my theater history class. So uh, I, I, I did have an idea that there was some history attached to it and I kind of want to dig further into it. But I also wanted to really quickly touch on what um, what you and Tabitha were talking about, the re about the relevance uh, uh, because for me, what I'm seeing um, is uh, there was a line that the the chorus uh, read of like, uh, um, just speaking about our country's flowers, speaking about the people who have died mm -hmm. in pursuit of this war or glory. Um, it makes me think about the people who are right now dealing with um, having to be emergency workers. Um, so there's that. And then what you said about the leadership, you're totally right about that. Before we even started this whole um, reading, me and Tony were talking about just, um, uh, I, I'm not, is it, is it Boris? Was it, uh, is that the prime minister? And, and, and his releasing of restrictions and, and the kind of complicated way he's re releasing of the restrictions. And then there's also Trump who's also trying to open up the nation and, and there's complications with that too, because it's it's then like, how do you how do you weigh or how do you average out the the cost of lives compared to the economic cost of uh, of of what's going on? How do you how do you in my mind, if you're a, a leader, you're you're trying to save these lives. Um, and I don't know if the leaders that we're dealing with right now are, are, are focused on that. I think they're more focused on the glory, financial um, financial glory. And I think maybe that's what makes Xerxes so, so sympathetic to us now 
is he does seem like he cares that he lost the people. If I mean, maybe just because he lost the glory, the people could have gotten him, but at least he seems remorseful, mm -hmm. right? Um, Evie and Tim on the high note that we're writing right now. Um, so you guys, I, I think maybe you've been in every reading we've done so far. Um, maybe Aeschylus, this isn't different from the others, but you know, the chorus, as we said, was very different. How did you approach this play differently from uh, the earlier? Yeah, I um, I love this play actually, and I I think the central role that the chorus plays in it is is I don't know how unusual it it is, but it seems like quite a departure. And having the chorus as this kind of leading character, I think certainly for me, I mean, I can't, I don't, I have no idea what the the audience of the time would have made of it. But but I just think that with this being a historical play, it's being such recent history, being in that theater, and then having the sort of the citizen, the, the voice of the people be so prominent must have been quite exhilarating and, and very relatable. And I, as Tony was saying, I mean, I think some of it is, there, <laughs> there is that very humorous moment when, when the chorus is talking to Darius and gets starstruck and, and they, they've been crying out for him to come, come up from the depths of, of the underworld. And then suddenly he's there and, and he's, and this chorus that don't stop talking suddenly is suddenly just says, Oh, I, I'm so in awe of you. I can't, I can't actually say what I want to say. I mean, it's sort of, it's very funny, but I, and I don't know whether it would have been funny, but certainly, for an audience, it must have been kind of enjoyable and relatable to see themselves represented in such a sort of large way in comparison to sort of most of these Greek tragedies, these, these most of the myth, myth making tragedies, I suppose. Yeah. So, um, and in terms of how we approached it, it, it was, yeah, I mean there are only two of us, not two hundred. So, so we 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 tried our best to convey yeah. those. We tried to get the neighbours involved, but no one was interested. <laughs> yeah, the distance would make for a pretty tight apartment without social distance. <laughs> yeah. um, so, Emma, um, when when you were looking at this um, play and cutting it down in the radical way you did, basically in half, um, what were you trying to bring out? Um. My main goal with the cutting that was represented was to, and, and I, I think it seems to have been accomplished, was to really bring the chorus front and center mm -hmm. um, and to allow the chorus to really have a significant role and a significant voice um, more so than they have maybe in past weeks because this is a tragedy of a nation. This is a tragedy of such a, it's incredibly community oriented in a way that like plenty of plenty of tragedies aren't plenty of the texts that we've read are community oriented but this one is on such a kind of macro scale that i really wanted to give it this double layer of this this really tight family unit of mother and father and son and this wonderful family dynamic lying right on top of this extreme national tragedy uh, which i think is something that we can very much uh, apply to present circumstances in that we are, a lot of us, a lot of our communities are simultaneously experiencing these very tight domestic tragedies and this very immense um, national tragedy. I, I hadn't thought about it in that way, just sort of how we see, it's a metonymic relationship, right? Between the family suffering and the suffering of the whole. Um, Paul, when, so you and I have been dealing with Greek literature for a long time. But this last eight week period represents for me my most intense engagement with tragedy. Um, and I'm seeing the words repeated. Uh, I'm seeing the themes recounted in ways I never had before because, you know, I'm just a homerist, right? Um, so how has, how has this uh, prolonged process changed your thoughts about tragedy and tragic performance? Um, well, it's, it's really, um... It's been an amazing kind of eight weeks so far and sort of amazing to think that we're sort of we're planning another sort of 32 weeks after this. So it's nice to be sort of a fifth of the way through and to be able to look back for a moment. Um, 
and actually, yeah, I, I think that I, I think that something that has really surprised me with it is how it's actually how well it, it takes to being to operating in this form. Actually, that there's something about being in this format and sort of the slight remove that we all have that actually um, really kind of brings a lot of power to what is being portrayed. And I think that that's, you know all of our actors today and in previous readings as well have just done such a fantastic job in terms of kind of making something kind of very real out of this slightly kind of strange sort of setting that we've been forced into. Um, and I think what it's also done for me is sort of actually start to kind of really point out as well. I mean, you kind of see those things which then are shared amongst amongst the tragedies. You might say, oh, that is sort of, um, there's a pattern emerging there. But also then when we kind of sort of tackle the Persians this week, you just suddenly appreciate the kind of the huge variety that exists within that. And I think that um, it's something that kind of came out again in several comments there about how th this is a this is a sort of a national kind of event um, them being sort of loaded onto one family. And it kind of seemed to me um, kind of really interesting how um, a lot of the time sort of in some of the other plays we've been looking at, it's even if, even if it's had a very sort of big draft backdrop of say the Trojan War, then there is still sort of, it's very much about sort of an individual's disaster. Whereas this is actually a nation's disaster. And it feels like you're sort of seeing the limits of endurance for someone with empathy. If you have empathy, then how much can you really, really take? Um, and I think that there was, um, yeah, something kind of quite, kind of brilliant about seeing the way um, Martin, you were playing Xerxes um, with that sort of trying to come to terms with there just being these thousands and thousands and tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people. And I felt that there was something kind of really brilliant about the, and it's something that we sort of, cut down a little bit, but actually it's the fact that you hear so many names in this. It's not just, oh, and then a hundred thousand people died. Actually you hear name after name, after name, after name, after name. Um, and there's something incredibly powerful about that. It, and it reminded me of those sort of memorial events where people take the time to read all of those names. And then it's only when you hear each one of them and you kind of think of all of the stories that each one of those people will have, that the real sort of, the real tragedy of any big event can really sort of start to be kind of real for you. Because otherwise it's just too big a thing to kind of comprehend. Um, so th that was something that just really kind of jumped out um, with this reading. And, and thank you to, to all of you for just doing such a brilliant job. Thank you, Paul. So Erica, this is your first week with us. Any sort of final word before I say